number one. I have to turn it on first. There we go. Thank you. Hello, Pastor Chris. Welcome. You look like you've been in a basketball game. <laughs> All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless your word today to our hearing, to our hearts. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds. Um, change us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the basics of good Bible study, and when you listen to a sermon, you know you're really doing Bible study, is always to have is to always look at the background of the book of the Bible, the text that you're reading, who wrote it, when it was written, and in the case of a letter, where it was written from, and why it was written, and those, those kinds of things. Well, today, we're going to look at the beginning of 1 Peter. And so we need to realize that this was a letter from a, that was written by a real person, to real people in a real place in history in a real culture with a much different socio-economic setting than we have here so you have to think about all those things so let's start talking let's start by talking about the author Peter when we first are introduced to Peter in the Bible we meet a man named Simon. Jesus later changed his name to Peter. So Simon Peter is from northern Israel. He's probably between 30, 20 and 30 years old. You know, when you see a movie of, you know, of, of the, with the disciples in it, they all look like me. You know, they all look about my age, you know, all gray and you know, not as bald as me, but, you know, some of those things, you know, they look old, but they're when they first met Jesus, some of them were in their teens, maybe middle teens. We're not sure, but they weren't really old. And Peter, at the time he's writing this, probably between 20 and 30. At the most 30, I think. He was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a lake and not a sea. And we, we believe, and you know, New Testament scholars believe that Peter's family was doing pretty well from their fishing business. I mean, they didn't have just one fishing boat, they had like a fleet. And um, this trade of fishing provided for their current existence and provision into the future. That's just how it was done in those days. And you know, just a fisherman's son would become a fisherman and his sons would become fishermen. And you know, the money stayed in the family and the boats stayed in the family and that kind of thing. So he was pretty secure in that business and Jesus called him out of all of that. So over the next few years, we can read a lot about Peter in the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels. And uh, we learn a lot about Peter's experiences with Jesus as one of Jesus' closest disciples. And Peter was in, I believe, Jesus' inner circle of close, very close friends. So he experienced a lot with Jesus. One of my favorite stories, and one of you know, everyone's favorite stories, is when Peter walked on the water. We all know that story, but let's review. Maybe some here haven't, we don't know that story well, but you know, it's always good to review that story. So, Jesus is out on this lake, and he's walking across the lake, and Peter and his friends are in the boat, and... Um, he sees Jesus walk, Peter sees Jesus walking on the water and he goes, whoa, hey Jesus, call me out to see, call me out to, to yourself. Call me out there. And Jesus goes, okay, come on out. And Peter just jumps out of the boat and he begins to walk on the water, right? And, and he just goes out there and then he notices the wind in his face and the water salt, the, the water sprinkling on his skin and body and he's a fisherman so he knows about this lake and he begins to sink and you know I won't tell you what I would have done if I would have been in that boat but you know some of you might have been just like Peter and jumped out some of you might have said hey that's pretty cool Jesus good for you I'm staying right here but 
Peter suddenly realized that he wasn't safe and he began to sink and Jesus of course as we know reaches out his hand and rescues Peter and says you have such little faith but you see Peter realized that he was way out of his comfort zone he realized the potential for pain or worse and he began to sink so that's when Jesus reached out his hand and rescued him. Now most of us, maybe not all of us, would have to admit that we don't enjoy not being safe. As soon as we realize that something isn't safe, what do we do? We tend to back out quickly. Whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me tell you a story about me. I in my free time I trap wild boar and about five years ago or so I told my wife I wanted to get that kind of permit to do that here in Japan and she went eh, isn't that dangerous and I said yeah but I'm gonna, I'm gonna study and it'll be alright and I went to this class and it was a, a day long class and then the next day we had a little bit of a review and then the test and in that class they told us many times about how the wild boar could you know e eat your arm and bite off your leg and you know just basically kill you in various and sundry ways and of course I didn't tell my wife that but anyway I, I passed the class and I got that and you know if I'd have told her now when she watches this video she's gonna know how dangerous it was and you know it, it, it is and uh, she might be saying uh, don't you want to stay home instead of doing that and you know but in, even if she does that you know she might say Kevin you need to back off on that but you know she just really wants me to be safe and you know that's what I want for my my wife too and that's what I want for my <clears throat> my sons and their families I want them to be safe I think we all feel that way and this is kind of like well you know I understand my feelings but you know I don't think I'm gonna back out of trapping wild boar because I like to eat them too much so but anyway it's kinda of like Peter's story isn't it <clears throat> not just like the one where he walked on the water but elsewhere in the Gospels we find that Peter in on some occasions be begins to lean back into a desire for safety and security and this is the guy who wrote this letter that we're going to read a passage from today he wrote to people in this early church that were definitely not safe they were definitely not secure these believers were in the midst of some intense difficult suffering they are facing intense persecution they were not safe so as I studied this message I began to think about how difficult it could be for us for us here where we are today to relate to what Peter is saying most of us are not going through intense persecution for our faith right now right our very lives aren't threatened because of our faith in Jesus I know we know some people who are living in those places and we talked about that at our church planning meeting the other night you know about some areas of the world I don't want to mention them here but where missionaries there are not safe so how do we connect with this 2,000 year old text that was written to people who were not afforded these freedoms you know the freedom to worship the freedom to come to church like we're doing today the freedom to talk about our faith on our lunch break how do we you know we have that here but they didn't have those freedoms and worse they were being mistreated and even killed because of their faith they were not safe because of what they believed now listen to this quote from Todd Hahn and David Van Verhagen, a couple of Christian authors. <clears throat> I'm going to read it. Sorry, I don't have a slideshow today. Okay, 
We may bemoan a moral decline in our country. Our actual concern, if truth be known, is not to see a vital Christianity flourish, but rather to secure a more orderly and less violent society in which to live out our comfortable and self-satisfied lives. In other words, we want a safer world. And we desire a safe faith, too. Now, how does that compare to the church that Peter is writing to? The early church was determined, it seems, to eradicate evil from the world. They were serious about their faith. No matter what the cost of personal sacrifice to them, it was. So, have we fallen as a church into a way of thinking and living that is all about trying to eradicate pain from our lives for our own personal welfare? So, what can we learn from the first part of Peter's letter? I think God has something good for us today. Let's open our Bibles or look in your bulletin. Or open up your apps to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and I'm reading from the CSB. Ready? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen, living as exiles, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief and various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The very word of God. Amen. Now Peter, the author, is writing to God's elect. Exiles. Scattered. Peoples. We later, <coughs> excuse me, find in this letter that Peter is writing from Rome. That Peter calls Babylon. He calls Babylon, uh, Rome Babylon. And that's where he's writing from. He sent the letter to these provinces in Asia Minor. And this would be modern day Turkey. These are churches where the believers are, were, were being persecuted. And by the way, are still being persecuted there today. Peter wrote to encourage them in their terrible suffering. He opens his letter by greeting them as the chosen people of God who are exiled through the world. Peter makes it clear throughout this letter that he's writing to Gentiles. He's not writing to Jewish believers. I'm sure there were some in the churches, but mainly he's writing to Gentiles, non-Jews. What is interesting is the language that he's using toward these Gentiles, Gentile believers. God's chosen ones. God's elect exiles. These are words from the Old Testament that described how God talked about the people of Israel. The family, the extended family of Abraham. Abraham himself was an exile. And he was a wanderer. Peter wants these suffering Christians, these suffering Gentile Christians, 
to see that through Jesus and his sacrifice that they now belong to the family of Abraham and they're just like him. They're no different. They're just like Abraham was. They are misunderstood. They're being mistreated. They are looking for their true home. This introduction to this letter that we just read contains a song of praise and adoration to God as we we've sang today in different form. And this is the God who causes people to be born again into a living hope, into the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and into the power of His Holy Spirit. Let me read again 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and unto an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. Hallelujah. Peter tells these suffering Christians about their new birth, about a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus into an inheritance that never perishes. Peter's approach to their suffering though is very interesting. He explains that life's hardships actually deepen our faith and make it more genuine. Did you hear that? Life's hardships actually deepen our faith and make it more genuine. And Peter can say this firsthand. He experienced this. Let's look at verse 6 again. You rejoice in this even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. In one sentence, in this one verse, Peter uses two key present tense verbs. The English doesn't translate straight across as pr one word, but he, these are present tense words, not something that happened in the past or something that will happen. But he's talking about what is happening to them right now. Rejoice and suffer grief. So being a disciple of Christ, Peter is saying, comes with both extreme joy and deep pain. <laughs> These seem like they contradict one another, right? Kind of paradox, right? But this shouldn't be the case for, um, we shouldn't think this way as followers of Jesus. Peter says that these things you've been suffering won't last. They endure for a short time or a little while. What he's saying is they are not eternal. Peter wrote about their internal inheritance. He's highlighting on purpose the temporary nature of their trials. Trials, Peter says, do have value. Oh, come on, Pastor Kevin. Trials? Oh, come on. Well, he says that the disciples in these churches can rejoice at the trials because they prove the genuine character of their faith and a faith that is of greater worth than gold and that will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. These hardships are like a refining fire. Even gold that is refined by fire perishes. But your faith will not. Your faith is actually of greater worth than a bunch of gold. Now let's pay attention to this. Peter says that there are many kinds of trials, various trials in some versions. And today, I want to look at just two kinds of trials. Number one, trials that we are currently in, the ones that you carried into church today, and the ones that you might be thinking of instead of listening. It's okay, I understand, it's hard. And number two, trials that we are trying to avoid. So let's do that again, trials that we are currently in. And number two, trials that we are trying to avoid. 
The first one are the ones we are experiencing at this moment. Think about something <clears throat> you are going through right now. And it's really, really tough. Some of you mentioned it in testimony time. And some of you asked for prayer requests. But keep this in mind as we talk about trials this afternoon. Now let me talk about first the trials that we are going through. And I mentioned my sister Priscilla and Shami. About three or four years ago, uh, my niece, beautiful woman, in her late 40s with a teenage daughter, began to uh, be irresponsible. Her home was, uh, she wasn't cleaning her home. She wasn't paying her bills. Uh, I mean, her home was, you, you can't imagine how dirty. She had animals, dogs and cats in her home. And she, I mean, she didn't throw anything away. And finally, we threw a little sleight of hand and um, with the help of, what do you call them, the a animal control folks had her taken out of the house so they could check on the pets. We had her put in a hospital for a while and we could realize that something severe had been happening to her. And my sister's been caring for her since that time and she's been on a steady decline ever since. And my sister is a Christian, some of you met her. And, you know, we've been praying for Shammy for years. You've been praying for Shammy for these years. And, you know, my sister and I argue about her care. You know, we fight about her care. I, I recommend, she asks me things, I recommend them, and she goes, oh, you're so insensitive. I'm going, okay. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and my wife and I are praying, and we look at pictures, and we remember how she was and what she is now. And it's really tough. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. I just want to be transparent with you. I still struggle with that. And uh, while I, I recommended hospice some time ago, it, it only happened now, but then now that it happened, I'm really saddened by it. And then, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry to cough in my mic. And then there's my wife's mother. My wife's mother has been uh, struggling with a, a blood disease for about 15 years. And she's been receiving regular treatment. It was every couple of months, and then it was every month, and then it was every week. And finally, it deteriorated, and then she contracted leukemia. I don't know if you contract it or it develops into leukemia. Whatever the correct medical term, I'm, I'm not sure. But she had to be hospitalized for a three-month period to get this special kind of treatment that will extend her life some. But the doctor told us that she really is terminal and we have to live with that. And so my mother-in-law not being a Christian, this is a big struggle and a big concern for my wife. And I'm concerned for my mother-in-law, but I'm also concerned for my wife and her well-being. And we mentioned Pastor Chris and his, his, how he's sensitive to our needs. He asked me recently by text, uh, Kevin, how are you doing? No, he didn't say that. He said, Kevin, how's Midori doing? You know, how's she going through this? No, he did ask how I was doing too. But, uh, but you know, that's, that's helpful and encouraging that somebody would just ask and that they are praying for her. But we are so concerned about her, about being able to witness to her, and it's a real struggle in, you know, mental disease, which my niece has a, a form of dementia, and cancer, which leukemia is a form of cancer. They just aren't fun. I would say something different if I weren't standing behind the pulpit about cancer, but you know what people say about cancer on social media. Look, we all go through painful trials. Health issues, relationship struggles, job frustrations, loneliness, stress, marriage difficulties, depression, and the list goes on. And we can all identify with some of these. We have these, we've been through these, we know somebody who is going through some of these. And one of the key things we learn from Peter is this, and we're not going to like to hear this. Without suffering, you can never become the person God wants you to be. Suffering 
is such a great opportunity for us to refine our faith. This is Peter writing this, not Pastor Kevin. Right? Without suffering, we can never become the person God wants us to be. Peter understood the value of trials, of the trials we go through, because after a few years with Jesus, Peter changed. And that's what happens when you spend time with Jesus. You cannot follow Jesus and stay the same. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus and stay the same. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, Peter was no longer that guy who was looking out simply for his own security and comfort and safety. He ended up being a guy who walked through intense persecution, hardship, and difficult trials because of his faith in Jesus. And he experienced the growth and change and development that comes from all of that. If you read 1 Peter and then read 2 Peter, you notice there's a change happening in that man. And here we are in 1 Peter and he's already changed. And now, what is Peter doing? He's helping the persecuted church in Asia Minor to understand that you can't grow without suffering. He's helping them to see that no disciple grows without trials. Is that what you came to hear today? <laughs> no! Something comforting, please! <laughs> Why is this? Because trials, sorrows, and hardships grab our attention like nothing else can. And when we reflect on the trials we go through, and when we think on the pain we experience, we grow. C.S. Lewis wrote in his inspirational book, The Problem of Pain, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciousness, but shouts in our pain. It is his meg megaphone to a deaf world. One of the core things I think Peter is getting to is this. Let suffering build your faith, not crush it. How do we do this? Well, for one thing, we have an illustration for Peter that helps us visualize what is happening. If we look back at verses 6 through 7, Peter says that faith gets refined in the same way that gold gets refined. By fire. Why? That our faith, or the character of our faith, can be proven to be real, to be genuine. This process results in praise, glory, and honor. And this is all far more valuable, far worth more to God, worth far more to God than a pile of gold. Peter's teaching us that life's trials are like a melting furnace that puts out so much heat that the impurities rise to the surface and get scraped away to leave a more pure result. Isn't this a beautiful and powerful image? But here's the double truth about that furnace. Being in a furnace can have the opposite effect, right? Instead of purifying something, it can burn it to a crisp. And all that's left is ash. And some of us are thinking, that's kind of how I feel right now. So when we face suffering, will it build our faith or will it crush it. You know, there's an instance where this actually happened in the Bible, where three teenage boys were thrown into a furnace. It's from Daniel chapter 3. Now, these three teenage boys were taken into exile, and in the country they were taken to, there was a king who was so full of himself. He was so in love with himself that he thought he was a god. He was powerful and he was a, a strong leader and he had built a, a great uh, nation and he was so full of himself that he had a huge golden statue built of himself. I mean it was so tall and it was of him and he 
called all the leaders of the nations together and he said, I want you to play all kinds of music with all kinds of instruments and whenever they, anybody in, around hears that sound, they must bow down to my, that image of me and, and worship that image of me. And when the order went out through the town, those three exiled Jewish teenage boys said, nah, I don't think so. We're not going to do that. We don't worship that God. We only worship the true God. So <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar had them brought before him, and he asked them if this was true. And he called out their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here you go. Here's your chance. We're going to play the music. You're going to bow down. And he said, they said, no, we're not going to do that. Same answer. And he became so enraged, so furious, so crazy with anger that he said, oh, now you've done it. Stoke the furnace seven times its normal heat and throw them in there. And he got his best marines, not soldiers, best marines to grab Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, tie them up and throw them into this furnace while he watched from a distance, I guess. I, don't, I, I can never picture how he could watch and see all of this. But, and so they grabbed those three teenagers and threw them into the fire, and the marines that threw them in were burned instantly to ash. And Nebuchadnezzar, this narcissistic king who thought he was God, sees something that he, even he recognizes as a miracle. He looks down into there and he sees Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walk, walking around, safe, unharmed. And <clears throat> he sees a fourth person. And he says to the leaders around him, he says, what's going on? I see not three walking around, but four. And the fourth one looks like a son of God. Come out. He called him out. He called out Shadmach, Meshach, and Abidno to come out. The fourth one doesn't come out. And they don't even smell like fire or smoke. The king is shocked, so shocked by this, that he's never the same. He changed so much and he began to be a protector of these three teenage boys. Now Nebuchadnezzar calls this fourth being that he sees a son of God, a son of the gods in some translation. So who was this? Some Bible te teachers will tell you this was Jesus and in theological terms that's called a Christophany, uh, a, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Um, others think it was an angel sent from God because later Nebuchadnezzar says God sent an angel to rescue them. Um, some people, here's another theological term, a theophany. It was a, uh, an appearance of a form of the true God. Um, whatever one you decide to believe and to understand in your mind, this was God himself coming to rescue these three godly teenage boys who stood firm in their faith that day. God was with these three boys in that furnace. They were never there alone. God's presence was there to sustain them in the furnace. Now my sister, as she struggles with the health issues of her daughter, knows with all her heart that she and her daughter are not alone. Shammy made a confession of Christ long before she got sick. And even after she got sick, she'd run up to the altar and get saved again. <laughs> kind of cute. But let her run up there and make that confession again. And Midori and I feel the same way for them. We feel the same way for Midori's mother. And her mother's not a believer yet, but we, we believe that God is with us as we try to witness to her in her hospital room. And I believe with all my heart that in your trial you are not alone. God, if we want him to, and thankfully many times when we don't want him to, will walk with us through every trial that we face or are about to face. 
And what Peter is teaching us is that when we go into the fire as his disciples, we go in with God before us, with God behind us, with God all around us, just like he was in the furnace with those three boys. And here's the difference now. Because he is also in us, <clears throat> God is turning us into something extraordinary, something beautiful, and something refined. The truth remains, brothers and sisters, without suffering, you can never become the person God wants you to be. And that is precisely why he does and will continue to walk with us. As we hold on to this truth, we get to decide, like we sang today, we get to decide that our trials and our sufferings will not crush our faith. No, or like Pastor Chris says, no, 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 no. <laughs> our trials will build our faith. They won't crush it. And what we read in this book called the Bible is totally opposite to what the world wants us to believe about suffering, isn't it? The principles and values that the world teaches is that pain is meaningless. There is no redemptive value in suffering and that trials must be avoided at all cost. But following Jesus contradicts all of that. Which brings us to our second point. The second trial that I'm going to talk about is different than the one we just discussed. This is the one I call the trials that we are trying to avoid. Please listen carefully. I know we listen to all kinds of preachers, uh, you know, all kinds of backgrounds and that and I listen to who you want and grow from what you can eat the meat and spit out the bone just like eating fish All right. but being a disciple of Christ doesn't mean we won't face suffering and trials anymore that is a lie so if you hear that switch uh, internet sites right? switch preachers following Jesus doesn't get guarantee that we will live long and prosper. That is not what we learn from the Bible. That is what we learn from Star Trek. That's for Trekkies. You live long and prosper. It's not the Bible teaching. Remember, our text today was written to believers who are facing persecution. And the proven character of their faith would have meant something very special to them. It was of greater worth than riches and prosperity and well-being. So faith means that I'm not going to be exclusively looking out for my own comfort and my own safety. I am not all about trying to avoid the tr trials that God has for me. And that is why in verse 7 of this chapter 1, Peter is relaying the same call and same direction that he personally received from Jesus for his life. When Peter was younger, he learned a lot from Jesus. But one of the main things that he held closely to his heart, closer to his heart than any other, were these four words. Take up your cross. A cross. Something that was designed to absolutely destroy someone. Jesus said to Peter, and Peter says to us, and Jesus says to us, take up your cross. But this is what Jesus lived. And this is what he calls anyone who would follow him to imitate. And Peter tells this to the persecuted church in Asia Minor. Take up your cross. These words resonated with the first century Christians as they faced intense suffering for their faith. So my question is to me and to us, what do these words mean to us today? Remember what I said earlier, that no disciple grows without trials. Well, if that's true, now listen, if that's true, then I wonder as a disciple of Christ, what is happening to my faith if I'm trying to avoid any trial that comes my way? Pastor, pray for me. I hurt my thumb on my iPhone. 
What is happening to my faith if I'm trying to avoid any trial that comes to my comes my way? Ouch, anyone? You know, someone actually wrote a book about dangerous things around us. I forgot to write the name of the guy who wrote it down, but it's called The Book of Risks. And he talks about different things around us, you know, in our daily lives. And he writes about dangers in our homes. Some we know are very obvious, you know, kitchen knives, things like that, electrical outlets, overloaded extension cords, you know, all your computer peripherals on one <laughs> extension guard. And you know, it made me think about <clears throat> my own home and things that are dangerous in homes here in Japan. And one of them comes out around this time of the year in Japan. Do you know what it is? You want to guess? Huh? How oh, close? Not even close. <laughs> the kotatsu. Kotatsu. So warm, so comfortable, and so deadly. <laughs> it's like the most dangerous thing in the house. Well, actually not in mine because I banned it many years ago. But in my house, it's my couch, or what we call the sofa. It's my sofa. <laughs> Why is that? I love my sofa. I actually keep a pillow and a blanket at the end of my sofa. Just in case I get in desperate need of a nap. But it isn't what is done on the sofa or the kotatsu that is dangerous. It is what doesn't get done that is dangerous. The people I don't serve from my sofa. The relationships I don't deepen on my sofa. The adventures for Christ I never begin. And the battles I never fight from my sofa. I just get too comfortable on my sofa. So as a disciple of Christ, the kotatsu and the sofa could be very dangerous. If faith found in and through trials is a greater worth than gold, then our next step should not be towards safety and security and comfort. Our next step should be toward that difficulty that I've been trying to avoid. As I study this text, as we study this text, personally, let me say it personally, I will never hear Jesus say, Kevin, take up your sofa and follow me. Doesn't say that. As we try to relate to this text, as believers in a very safe Japan in 2019, maybe there's something that we've been avoiding, something that we need to actively pursue in spite of the difficulty it will bring to us. Here's what I'm trying to say. We can discover our purpose that God has for us as we intentionally step into difficult and uncomfortable situations. Because I have a God-given purpose as a disciple of Christ, it allows me to face the potential for pain, and not only to survive it, but to th thrive in it. Some of us are sitting here today, and God has been nudging you to something big for a while now. Is that you? Is there something God has called you to that you've tried to ignore? Is there something God has been breaking your heart over, prompting you toward action? But you don't feel it's very safe. It's threatening. It's going to involve some pain. Well, will we get out of the safe Christian bubble that we've created for ourselves, filled with our own ideals and goals. I remember several years ago, Pastor Chris were talking, and I were talking about the English service, and he said, kind of firmly and loudly, he says, I want people to realize this is not a Christian club. This is God's church. It's not a club. We don't come here to just do fluffy fun things and go away and then don't change. Something like that. Don't remember the exact words, but that's, that's it. 
in light of our desire for fun or comfort and safety, we need to ask ourselves, what painful thing have I been avoiding? Whatever that trial is, the answer to this question is, our avoidance of it has been and will continue to be detrimental to our faith. Until we take a step toward that thing, knowing that God goes with me, our faith will not grow as it could be growing and flourishing. If we attempt to create or continue to live in a safe and comfortable, pain-free Christian life, we will be insulating ourselves from experiencing the proven character of our faith that is more valuable than gold. So the thing you really want in your life, you're... you're insulating yourself from. You know what insulation from? Keeps you from the outside, from the heat and the cold from outside. You insulate yourself. You don't let it come to you. We limit our opportunities to experience the sometimes dangerous life that God has called us into. And as a result, the refining fire that purifies our faith. Let me read this quote from Erwin McManus that he wrote in his book and listen to the title of this, this will give you an idea The Barbarian Way <laughs> great w here we go when we are born again we are dropped not into a maternity ward but a war zone our birthplace is less mother's womb and more battlefield earth maybe the first word we heard shouldn't be welcome, but jump. <laughs> it might be time for some of us to jump. The Christian faith is not a safe one. It shouldn't be. Some of us have been told and have told others, I'm guilty, just follow Jesus and your life will be better. And we've equated the word better with safer. That's not gospel. It's not the truth. Sometimes it's just the opposite. It, it gets more dangerous. True followers, true disciples of Christ, like Peter, not only walk through trials, they walk to trials, into trials. Following Christ must be a life of risk. A life of freedom, yes, but certainly a life of, of adventure. Trials are how we become exactly who God wants us to become. Pastor Kevin, this is just hard. Okay, let me tell you about my granddaughter then. Let's, go, let's do something sweet. I've got five granddaughters. Six years old, five years old, four years old, two and a half years old, and one year old. Something like that. Yeah, all grand, all cute. All super cute. I mean the cutest on earth. Don't argue with me. Yeah. Well, Chris, Chris is... Yeah, she's... All right. Well... Number one, don't tell my granddaughters. Okay. But Yuriko, my two and a half year old, she couldn't talk very, I mean, she could barely say a few words until about two or three months ago, and then she started talking way too much. So she says every, her Japanese has exceeded mine in just a couple of months. So she started liking to play hide and go seek, and she really doesn't know how to play it, and neither does my five year old granddaughter yet. They still don't get it. But anyway, she wants to play all the time. And she says, Papa, kakuremba shio. Papa, that's the southern word for grandpa or ji or whatever, yeah. Papa. Let's play hide and go seek. And so we, she comes to my house five days a week, Monday through Friday. We get a, my wife, I'm sorry, we, I just play with them. My wife feeds them and changes their clothes and gets them to daycare. <clears throat> so when they finish their breakfast, I get to play with them. So she says, Papa, let's do hide and go seek. I'm translating. And so my, my older granddaughter liked it when we hid in closets and dark, creepy corners of the house, you know, and nobody could ever find us. She liked it. She would go, yeah, it's great. But when I get, when I just put a towel or a blanket over our face, Yuriko says, kawaii. And she makes face like, kawaii, I'm scared. It's scary. It's scary. Don't put that blanket on her. Don't, let's not hide. Let's just play seek. Let's just, and, and she, she said, Kawaii. And I said, Oh, it's okay. It's okay. And she said, Kawaii. Afraid. And she said, Popo, 
Are you afraid too, Popo Mokoi? I said, yeah, Popo was afraid too. And she reached up to my bald head and rubbed me on the head. Popo, daijop. It's okay. Popo, it's okay. Wow. <laughs> Nothing better in the world. I mean, God could have taken me to heaven right there and it would have been enough. I believe her. I believe her. I hope she keeps that pure, simple faith when she meets Jesus in her own personal life someday. And she, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I'm praying that God, I'm praying that you and I and Yuriko and all my ch grandchildren, children and grandchildren in this church will believe God with this kind of assurance. It's okay that we can look at our trials and suffering. We're, what Yuriko is saying, yes, it's scary, but it's okay. Right? This kind of assurance, there's an opportunity to fully trust in the fact that God will be right there with us. The same way he's with those three teenage boys in the furnace. And in the end, guess what? It's going to be okay. Daijou. God is not wasting our pain, brothers and sisters. He didn't waste Jesus' pain when he went to the cross for all humanity. Peter lived all of this. He was speaking from experience as he related this experience, his experiences to the suffering church of that day. And the Holy Spirit, through his holy word, relates it to us today. Let me close by praying the last two verses of our text for today. Could, if we could get the worship team to come up. I'd like to close by reading verses 8 and 9 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Not literally, but almost literally. Let's pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, though we have not seen you, we love you. And even though we can't see you now, we believe in you and rejoice in you with inexpressible and glorious joy. Father, this is because we are receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.